Hi, sugar. It's your girl, Risa, y'all. Coming to you. Happy Wednesday, everybody. It is now Wednesday. It is hump day, y'all. <laughs> we got over that monkey hump. Do y'all hear me? Yes, we are at this point of it is almost the weekend. And I just pray that everybody start their day off right with a blessing, with a prayer, with laying it all before the Lord and giving it to him and let him walk you through it. Yes, we're going to start off with some devotional, y'all. Yes, honey, yes. So, um, let's see what we're going to start with. So we're going to start with why fear the forgiver. So those of you that want to get your pen and paper and write these things down, that way you can read them on your own, you can study them, you know, in your time. Let me get my highlighter. So the first scripture for this devotional is Psalms is Psalms. Psalm, P-S-A-L-M, Psalm 130, verse 4, and Psalm 130, verse 5, and 7. Hold on one second. Give my glasses. Get my glasses, y'all. I got to get used to these glasses. Mm -hmm. Y'all, I think I got an oval-shaped face. Don't I? Oblong something. This bad boy is... Mm. Let me tell you what somebody did to me one time. You know, on certain sites, they do this thing where they compare your picture to something else that they feel like you may look like. Somebody put my picture next to a horse. You know, the horse got a long face. <laughs> it was, it was, I was like, really? Okay. And I just let it go, you know, because I know everybody, I am beautiful in my own way. God created me. I'm a designer original and he don't make mistakes. But, you know, men have their own perception of what beautiful is, what gorgeous is. But I know one thing. I am who I am. And I know everybody not going to like me, but I am learning to love me. Do you hear me? I am learning to like who I am. A long face, skinny nose, fat cheeks, pie face, whatever you want to call it. It's little old me. Because mm -hmm. this don't make who I am. Mm -hmm. No, it don't. I thought I would share that with y'all. Not that anybody recently has said anything, but it's just something that happened to me at one point in life. And that was when I was really, 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 really vulnerable. I was going through some things, some things, things, okay? Yeah. And I still pushed my way through. Glory be to God. He, Yes, he was right there. He hugged on me. He just took that little, just that little, you know, you get that feeling in the pit of your stomach when you're like, oh, here we go. You know, I don't like negativity. I don't. I don't like confusion. I don't like criticism. I don't like none of that. I don't like it. But it's a part of life. And I just ask God to continue to strengthen me and everybody else that has to go through it. Mm -hmm. So he said he'll fight my battles and he's going to do just that. So let look at these glasses. They're not thick. That's the frame, and the frame is literally wider than the lens. I didn't want a thin lens uh, frame, so that's what I got. It's just that little bifocal at the bottom I'm trying to mm -hmm, deal with. So here we go. I got a, and I used to wonder why you see people look over their glasses like this, because you got to look over that line. And then you see them look like that. It's because they got to see certain things through there. So that's where I am, y'all. So it's there is forgiveness with you. That you may be feared. That's Psalm 134. 
with all my heart, I am waiting. I am waiting, Lord, for you. I trust your promises. Trust the Lord. He is always merciful and he has the power to save you. That's Psalm 135 and verse 7. Um, and it says, it seems like a paradox. God loves you and forgives your sins, but you're still supposed to fear him. Why should you dread someone who pardons who pardons you? Though fear and forgiveness seem like contradictory concepts, they actually go hand in hand. That's because godly fear is not terror. It is reverence. It is reverence. That's because godly fear is not terror. It is reverence. When you truly respect God, you honor his commands. You acknowledge, you also acknowledge when you violate his law because you want to maintain a good relationship with him. Out of reverence to God, you confess your sins. Out of love, he heals and pardons you. So ultimately, fear and forgiveness teach you the love of the Lord and that dear friend, is a very good thing. Why fear the forgiver is the title. Hmm. So when you talk about fear the Lord, it's not be afraid of him. It's to have respect for him. You know how with adults or you got an older family member, somebody that you um, that you trust, you know, that you respect, it's the same thing. You know they're not going to lead you astray. They're going to give you some good information. You know how big mom, you got a big mama that you know going to always know she know what she know. And it's not fake and phony. It's not just to tell you to blow smoke up your nose. She know. You reverence her. You trust her. You respect her. And that's what we're supposed to do for God. Know that his word is true. Trust him. Respect him. Even when we fall short, we can still go to him, Lord, I just made the wrong decision. Help me, God. Forgive me, God. I just committed a sin. I just cussed this lady all the way out. And I know it was wrong, but I gave it to my flesh. Please forgive me. Help me to right my wrong. And we can do that. Okay? The next one is called A Mountain Unshakable. Psalm 125 verse 1 and Psalm 125 verse 2. Those who trust in God are like Zion Mountain. Nothing can move it. A rock solid mountain you can always depend on. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, the Lord surrounds his people now and forever. And the devotional reads, tragedy strikes, tragedy strikes. But you have to be strong. The wind is knocked out of you, but you must stay steady for others. You try to be brave, but you just want to cry. Friend, the more you insist, you're an unshakable mountain of strength, the more likely you are to crumble. If you really want to be strong for those around you, then direct them to God. Yeah. And be honest about how he helps you in your weakest moments. It's your trust in God that makes you strong. Not anything you can do on your own. So go ahead and weep. But also trust God to be strong enough for you. And everyone else as well. That is so, so, so true. I think about. Um, different times in my life oh, excuse me when things went on and I just really didn't know how I was going to make it I went from working and going into labor early I didn't have any health benefits on my job 
But you know how when you when you try to prepare yourself for something. Okay, I'm going to be strong. I'm going to have all my ducks in a row, this, that, and the other. I, I'm going to do this around this time. You prepare yourself. You lay out your plan. But baby, when a monkey wrench is thrown in that, in that plan, what do you do? I have, have been in that position. I knew what kind of job I had. I knew what kind of benefits I had. And I was like, you know, I don't want to have no more children. It was hard. I used to be sick all the time. The whole pregnancy, I would be sick. I couldn't enjoy my pregnancy. You know, I knew I didn't have any benefits and that I may have to be off on my job and not have any type of safety net. You know, I knew I didn't make a whole lot of money. And um, I knew, and people may not believe it, but I tried so many years to get my tubes tied. I had even been on the operating table, getting ready to go into the operating room to get my tubes tied. And they come back and say, no, they can't do it. You know, and then, you know, I use all types of protection. I'm going to go on and testify right now for real. Um, Because I used to work next door to Planned Parenthood. And back then, Planned Parenthood gave out all kind of condoms, spermicides, the vaginal rings, birth control pills. They gave them out so that you could protect yourself. And you best believe me. I knew that I was active. I knew that I didn't want any more children. And I had to do something about it. I knew that my body did not belong to me because I was married. It belonged to my husband. And he had needs that needed to be satisfied. And so did I. And I could use condoms. I could use everything on the market to ensure that I did not get pregnant. But guess what? I went through some things. I made some choices in my life that I thought was right and so found that they were wrong. And then I started to have health problems. I would go because I would have so much pain in my lower abdomen. And I would go to the doctor and they were like, well, we can't find anything. We don't see anything. Everything is normal. But I knew I hurt like all oh, get out. Okay. I had an IUD placed in. So I had an IUD, but I'm still buying spermicide. I'm still buying rubbers. I'm still buying um uh all this good stuff to make sure that I don't get pregnant because I look I'm not having no more children. Okay. I one day realized that I was trying to take my life into my own hands. That I was that I felt some kind of way that I would I could tell the Lord what what for him not to do. I could tell him what to do and I can't do that. And I had to apologize to him. And sure enough, my first three children, I tried to get my tubes tied. They told me, uh, you got to take classes. Okay, take the classes, sign the papers, get in there. Well, you need to be a certain age. Okay, that's the second time. The third time going there, um, the doctor, he didn't believe in doing that. And I was like, I wish you'd have told me you don't believe in birth control when you became my doctor, which he didn't tell me that. So that's the third time. And then I went through that whole stage of, you know, protecting myself with the IUD and all of that. And for three years, I went through having just total pain. And on that day, when I told, asked the Lord to forgive me and I went and let them take that IUD out, I promise you, the blessing of the Lord was instant. Instant pain relief. I mean, instant. Soon as she took it out, I had no more pain. I didn't have to take no pain medicine, nothing. I was like, I wish I'd have known that three years ago. And I asked the Lord to forgive me. I made some choices that I made, and I told him I would never do that again. And so he tried me. And he asked, he not asked me, he forgave me. And here it is. I got pregnant again. Okay. They um, told me they were going to tie my tooth. Came back and told me they couldn't do it because they really didn't have time to do it because he said he would be setting this stuff up for a, law a lawsuit. They didn't have time to even prep me for it because Jayla came early. Okay, so I'm going to prepare myself the next time. So I done took the class, signed the papers, got the right doctor, didn't need to do anything in case because they already knew I had a history of my babies coming early. So I had everything in a row. Get in there, get ready to go to the operating room. Doctor come in and say she can't do it. I can't do it. Now, you know how you have a team of doctors. 
And you know, you may not see your same doctor all the time, but they're all on the same team. So she, my doctor was out that day when I went in labor and she was, this other doctor stepped in. They already knew about my case. She comes to tell me, no, at the last minute she can't do it. I said, well, look, I got a baby coming. We have to discuss that later. She told me she wasn't going to do it. Baby mad. And guess why? Because God had a plan. He did it. All of those children, he wanted his children to be born. And guess what? No matter how many times you get yourself tied up, how many rubbers you use, it don't matter. Life don't come about until God say yes. Mm-hmm. It don't come about until he say yes. I don't care if you sleep with Tom, Dick, and Harry. If God want a child to be made at that moment, it is going to happen. If he do not, it will not happen. So there's nothing about us that say, oh, I went and created me a baby. You ain't did nothing. You were the you were the vessel that God used to bring his child into this world. Mm-hmm. When you find yourself in that position, if you really want to be strong, how do you be strong? I found myself being without a job, without benefits, and I, I now have this baby that's two pounds, one ounce. That I don't know what she's gonna need. I don't, they telling me she's blind. They telling me she's deaf. She tell, they telling me her organs are not developed. You can literally see through her skin like tissue paper. Her little foot was that long. She was 13 inches long. You know, she's having apnea and braids, meaning she stops breathing and her heart stops. All of this stuff is going on and you just, you gotta be strong. And God spoke to me and he said, she is okay. She is in my hand. I chose this moment to teach you something. And you know, I'm a, I'm, I'm, I'm a testimony that God has come to me on several occasions and spoken to me. And of course, I didn't know his voice. Cause I'm like, I don't know. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it was just that strong. I was like, Oh, hey, wait a minute. Now, when, the first time I knew it was him talking to me. But I kind of, at first, I was like, okay, am I having a panic attack? But then he kept talking, and it just, I was like, okay, thank you, Lord. You know, the second time, um, he did some things, and I was like, it was just so loud. Because here it is now, I had prayed for something for so long, and he was granting it to me. I prayed to be able to have, to experience my labor of childbirth without the ha without having um really really bad pain and i tell you what my contractions started they never got any worse than real bad menstrual cramp i mean real bad the kind you be balled up but they never got to be like labor pain and he granted me that wish i prayed for it and he gave it to me he told me in my hospital room, my husband was in the chair asleep, and I was in the room by myself. I had prayed to be able to feel my baby exiting my body without all that pain that was distracting me. And so I asked for an epidural when they told me that um I was going to start, that they were going to break my water. And when the nurses left, God spoke to me and said, you're not going to need it. Just like that. And I'm looking around, I said, oh, I know I have anxiety. I know I have panic. And I'm like, Lord, I am hearing things now. And he says, again, you're not going to need it. But I disobeyed him. And I let them put that thing in my back anyway. And guess what? I felt the tube the entire time. And when they got ready to turn it on, Corey's heart rate dropped. So they had to, they had to, they just could not use it. And they was like, well, we're not going to be able to use that because they all stand around. They didn't tell me what was going on. I just noticed a, a flood of nurses come in the room. And I'm like, okay, well, they getting ready to do some things to me. I was blind to the fact that my baby heart rate just dropped. And they were like, well, turn on your side. to put the oxygen this way, this, that, and the other. And I said, am I supposed to feel this thing in my back? She was like, no. And I said, well, I do. She said, well, no, maybe it's just, you know, the you feel or something else. Okay, she's going to tell me what I feel. I left that alone. And she said, well, we can start to push. I literally was on the phone with my best friend. 
And I was on the phone with her while I was pushing. When I got ready to push, I said, hold on. <laughs> when it got to it got intense to the part where I had to push him, that last little bit of skin over his head, I told I to call you back. But, I mean, he granted my wish. That's that. When you are weak, he is strong. That's that part where let him be your strength. It's your it's your trust in God that makes you strong. Not anything that you can do. I couldn't do it on my own. But the trust in him. Because I could have made a decision that I'm going to change my situation. And I'm going to go and terminate this pregnancy because I can't do it. Now, I have done that before. Felt like I couldn't do it. I didn't trust God. I didn't know God. I didn't know that. And I told the Lord, all I needed was one person to say it would be okay. And I wouldn't have done it. You know, I just, and he knew. And he answered my prayer. He he did. He did. He forgave me. But that's that, that's that little something that we need. No matter the situation that we're in, let him come and help you. He didn't say, when they say you got to be strong, that don't mean you can't cry. Cry. But just don't give up. A mountain unshakable. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, the Lord surrounds his people now and forever. What a blessing that is. A welcome pursuit. Psalm 9, verse 10. Those who know your name will trust in you, for you. Let me say that again. Those who know your name will trust in you, for you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. The Lord has made himself known. Psalm 9, verse 16. And the devotional reads, Chase fame, power, accomplishment, or social status. And you may discover that the more you have, the more unstable you feel. That is so true. Try to fill your innermost needs with wealth, relationships, or activities. And you will probably find yourself with, an, with a greater sense of dissatisfaction than you have ever felt before. Attempt to escape your sorrows with food, alcohol, or substance. And the gnawing emptiness within you will only increase. Yet pursue God and the doors of joy, doors of joy and fulfillment will spring open. Not only does he give you a firm place to stand and satisfy your soul, but he also fills your life with his presence, his love and purpose. Seek him with all your heart, therefore, because you will certainly find what you are looking for. A welcome pursuit. pursuit. Those who know your name will trust in you for you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. The Lord has made his, himself known. Hmm. Seek him. Seek everything about him. And that is true. I have tried to feel myself. You know, when you're hurt, you feel yourself. You're going to soothe your pain with a bucket of ice cream. You're going to soothe your pain by surrounding yourself with friends and trying to comfort yourself in whatever way possible um, with relationship, with going shopping. You know, we have shopping business, especially when we're hurting, going through. But none of that, it might satisfy you at the moment. When you get home and you sit down and you think about all that you just did to do away with this hurt and this pain, you just created another problem. You have maxed out your credit card. You have gained eight pounds by eating a bucket of ice cream. And your problem is still there. And then you have two more problems that is facing you. Fall on your knees and pray and give it to God and let him bless you. And when I say bless you, and I'm not talking financially, let him come and wipe your slate clean. Let him come and fill you with the Holy Spirit. Let him give you the peace that surpasses all understanding. 
let him come and give you the strength that moves mountains. Let him come and make up all your crooked, crooked, broke, busted, and disgusted ways straight. He will do just that. A welcome pursuit. Pursue him. When you're weary, pick up your Bible and read. When you're when you're weary, just call on him. Talk to him just like you would your best girlfriend. Let him come and help you. Encircled by strength. Psalm 125 and 2. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people. From this time forth and forever. Now. Hmm. Those who trust the Lord are like Mount Zion, which can never be shaken. It remains firm forever. Now, the one before that had the same scripture, a mountain unshakable. Now, this one is called encircled by strength. The word Jerusalem may be translated teaching or legacy of peace. May be translated to teaching or legacy of peace. Undoubtedly, the city of David was very tranquil. When the psalmist lived there. What is that? Be tressed by mountains. By Mount Olive and Scopus. As well as the valley of Kimon. Now these are some words. Wow. Tyro Cohen. And I may be saying them wrong. Y'all forgive me. And Kidron. And Jerusalem was virtually inaccessible to invading armies. She was indeed a place of peace. Sadly, enemies eventually found a way in. As it is generally the case with any earthly defense. History bears witness that the tranquility that once characterized Jerusalem is no more. Has this happened to you? Have, you, have your earthly defenses failed you? Remember, they are imperfect. And may falter. But the living God is your true protection. He will teach your heart lasting peace. That none can ever take away. By surrounding you. With his love. Wisdom and strength. From this time forth. And forevermore. Encircled by strength. As the mountains surround Jerusalem. So the Lord surrounds his people. Let him protect you. When you are weak. He is your strength. Let him protect you. A heavenly perspective. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. He observes the son of men. His eyes examine them. I trust in the Lord for protection. That is Psalm 11 verse 4 and Psalm 11 verse 1. And the devotional reads. Is safety important to you? Would you like to feel secure in your home, finances, relationship, and occupation? Are you ever afraid of the future, of being unprepared for the challenges ahead? Fears about the unknown can steal your peace. Yet understanding that although your perspective is limited, God is not. That is why your best safeguard is always to trust him. Have you ever? Yes, Lord. From his heavenly throne, God sees the trouble on the path before you. He sees every single day of your life before you even reach that moment. And he can lead you through them unarmed, unharmed. Hmm. He also examines the damages within you. The harmful behaviors that undermine your life and frees you from them. Therefore, be con confident in God's unfailing perspective and discover real security in your relationship with him. There is no safer place to be than in his wonderful care. A heavenly perspective. Teardrop. And I, I don't know if I did this particular devotion in another video. I might have and didn't upload it. But I'm going to go ahead and read it again. They who, saw, they, they who sow in tears shall reap in joy and singing. Psalm 125, 126 and 5. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy. Psalm 126 verse 6. 
and the devotional reading. God has not allowed one of your tears to drop to the ground. He's caught them all and made them into something beautiful. But all that you've been through, you've been uniquely trained to comfort those who are going through the same thing. Yes, Lord, be a vessel. You know what it is to hurt as they hurt, fear as they fear, and yearn as they yearn. You can show them how to survive and be comforted as you have been comforted. The tears of your biggest hurts have been resurroundingly transformed into your most amazing opportunities for ministry. So today, praise God for helping you overcome your trials and console others with the wisdom you have received. Your teardrops have not gone unnoticed. He knows. He feels. He sees. And he is working in your favor. Let them fall where they may. And let God come and bless you. And only the way that he can. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? Consider and answer me, O oh Lord, my God. I've thrown myself headlong into your arms. I am celebrating your rescue. I'm singing at the top of my lungs. I'm so full of answered prayers. That's Psalm 1, that's Psalm 13, 1 and 3, Psalm 13, 5 and 6. And the devotional reads, after weeks, months, perhaps even years of waiting for the Lord to work in a certain situation, you may feel weary and your hope may be fading. Maybe you are wondering, why is God taking so long? Now, y'all, I'm going to go ahead and admit, I have not read this. But I was just talking about this same thing. Thank you, Lord. Confirmation. Why is God taking so long? Why isn't he answering my prayers? Will this ever end? Waiting is difficult, but it is also necessary because it builds your faith in him. That is because you resolve to trusting him even when every circumstance tells you not to. God rewards you by fulfilling the desires of your heart in a way more wonderful than you can ever than you ever thought possible. Excuse me. Therefore, friends, do not be discouraged. Your wait is not in vain. God's provision is coming, and when it does, you will truly have great reason to rejoice. So just hold on. Even when you think he's not going to answer, he is going to answer. Just hold on. And you know, I read somewhere and it says a way to make it through what you're going through is for you to love on somebody else. For you to go and help and encourage somebody else when they, even when you are going through. Forget about your life. When what you're going through, you go and you help somebody else. You be everything for somebody else while you're waiting on God to come and do for you. Useless. Mm -hmm. Unless the Lord builds a house, its builders labor over it in vain. Unless the Lord watches over a city, the watchman says, the watchman stays alert in vain. It is useless to work so hard for a living. Getting up early and going to bed late for the Lord provides for those he loves while they are asleep. The Lord will wake up. He will bless you. He works in your favor even when you sleep. All of the things that you feel like you got to stay up about, calculating bills and robbing Peter to pay Paul, you don't have to do all of that. God already knows. Take your request to him and let it be known. Go to him in prayer and talk to him and give it to him. And just lay down in peace and rest and watch him work. He will do it. Solomon is known at the, as the wisest man who ever lived. And he knew one thing to be absolutely true. Everything must have God at its foundation. Point blank in the period. Success, security, and joy all must be established through God's wisdom and power or they will fade away. This 
is because anything that's not based on God returns to dust. Yet everything that God does lasts forever. Friends, family, sisters, cousins, brothers. You're working hard for what you have. But if God is leading you, you're chasing the wind. So spend your life on things that will have everlasting results. Obey God and trust his superb plans for you. Because when you work for him, you know it's never in vain. It's never in vain. Last one, you guys. I think. Wait a minute. Am I good enough? Lord, who can dwell in your tents? Who can live on your holy mountains? Such people will stand firm forever. That's Psalm 15 verse 1, Psalm 15 verse 5 in the devotional read. Psalm 15 goes to the heart of humanity's deepest problems. If anyone, is anyone worthy of living in heaven with God? You are told that you must be honest and kind and that you must keep all the Lord's commands and never do wrong to others. Reviewing these requirements, you may question whether you can ever truly meet God's standards. That is as it should be. Hmm. The inability to be good enough makes you aware of your need for God's help, mm -hmm. which he graciously provides through the death and the resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. So even when you find yourself being unworthy, not being able to keep all of the things that he has placed in his word, when you're not able to follow them to the letter, guess what? You don't have to. You need to try. Don't just go out and mess up just to be messing up. You need to try. But guess what? He graciously provided all of that through the resurrection of his son. The inability to be good enough mm -hmm, makes you aware of your need for God's help, which is graciously provided through the death and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. When you trust him for salvation, God covers you with his righteousness and makes you worthy to dwell with God for eternity. So believe in him, trust in his provision, because then you can rest in his goodness forever and ever and ever. Am I good enough? No. But I make it because of the grace of God. Mm -hmm. Blessed with rest. It's useless to rise early and go to bed late and work your worried fingers to the bone. Don't you know he enjoys giving rest to those he loves? Unless the Lord builds a house, the work of the builders is wasted. Unless the Lord protects a city, guarding it with century will do no good. You know all there is to accomplish and how little time there is to finish it all. So you try to press on, straining your body and mind to continue. However, it is useless. You cannot go any further. The weariness has completely overtaken you. Put you to the point of no return that you feel. What can you do? First, you must accept that you need rest. Second, you must acknowledge that you're having so much trouble because you're trying to do everything in your own strength rather than in God's strength. Express your faith in him by resting in his care. Give your burdens to him and trust him to renew you with his energy, wisdom, and efficiency. You will be amazed at all he will accomplish through you. So working yourself to the bone, working yourself, being up, trying to make sure everything is pristine. I talked to my husband about this today because each year we invite people over for Thanksgiving. 
And I told, and I thought about in the Bible how um, I was reading something, and he just talked about how there were the two ladies, and and Jesus was coming, and one um, was so busy with the things, you know, preparing the meal and making sure the house and this, all this his stuff, you know, was just on point for Jesus. And the other one, all she could think about is just worshiping at his feet. And y'all know I'm paraphrasing. And I think about the holiday season. Working myself to the bone. Wiping down walls. Washing curtains and vacuuming. And getting the dust out the corners. Getting the dust off the the, the ceiling. And all of this kind of stuff. I got to do all of that in order for people to come over and fellowship with us. And I told him, you know, I don't want that to be my focus as to why people come to my house. People come to my house to fellowship and have a good time and to eat a good meal. Okay. To have a good time to relax and enjoy each other. That is my focus. All of that other stuff is for just everyday cleanliness. Okay. And so working yourself totally to the bone to your frantic and dull tired. You do all this stuff just for one day. You done saved up and saved up and scrimped and scraped because the Black Friday sale is coming. You done work overtime, overtime and taking everybody else's shift. You can barely stand up on half of your toes, let alone all ten toes and your feet. Okay. You're working yourself to a foolish tizzy. And for what? Whatever is going to be, is going to be. First, call on the Lord and ask him. Give him your request. And let it be made known as to what you want. Don't, don't work yourself to death. Let God have it. Let him be your strength. When it's time for you to get off of work, if you're not dog tired and somebody needs to call out and you're able to work for them, then yeah, but don't go around asking everybody, can you have, you know, if you want to go home early, because I want to get some overtime. Don't work yourself to death like that. Because it ain't going to be worth it. It's not. Because what if you're too tired to even celebrate or to see the fruits of your labor? That's not good. Mm-hmm. So, this last one is always with you. I feel completely secure because you protect me from the power of death. I have served you faithfully, and you will not abandon me. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternity, eternal pleasures at your right hand. And the devotional reads, that is Psalm 16, 9 and 10, and Psalm 16, verse 11. Loneliness can strike for many reasons, loss, rejection, separation from loved ones, yet if you allow it to consume you, alienation, insecurity, and thoughts of unworthiness can become your private prison, one that is incredibly destructive and difficult to escape from. Friends, God wants to free you from your loneliness through his enduring presence and his healing care. With him, you never have to fear being alone because he assures you of his unfailing love. As you grow closer to him, he he not only teaches you to have a fulfilling relationship with him, but he gives you that with others as well. So whenever the bondage of loneliness begins to close around your heart, trust the one who will never leave you or forsake you. You will be glad that you did. The reward, the rewards of obedience. A man who obeys the Lord will, sh- will surely be blessed. Let me say that again. A man who obeys the Lord will surely be blessed. That's Psalm 128 and 4 and Psalm 128, 1 through 2. Happy are those who respect the Lord and obey him. You will enjoy what you work for. And you will be blessed with good things. And the devotional reads. Why not just do what you want. Forgetting God's commands. And follow your own desires. You know the answer. Because there have been times. That you've done that. 
very thing. You've gone against God's instruction and have caused your own grief. Your plans left you unsatisfied, lonely, and full of regret. Mm -hmm. Just the opposite has been true. Whenever you've submitted yourself to him, the task may have been difficult, but his presence energized you and filled you with his indescribable joy. You saw his amazing work. You saw it in your life and experienced the blessing of being in his will. You know how rewarding obedience can be? So do as he says in every situation. Because God is fair. He will not forget the work you did and the love you showed to him. Read Hebrews 10, I mean Hebrews 6, verse 10. The rewards of obedience. Thank you, Lord, for all of the many blessings that you have given us. Thank you for your word and these devotions that you have laid out before us, all of the confirmation, all of the eye-opening situations and things that you have shown us of where we may be or where we may have been. We thank you for making a way out of no way. We thank you today for the people that you have used in this devotional to come and give us the word that we need on a daily basis. We don't put this in place of your word because your word is true and that's what we lean on. But I say thank you, God. Thank you for all that you have done. Thank you for saying and making me know that I am good enough. I can have rest and not work myself to the bone. And trusting you is always the best answer. Knowing that I have good boundaries, that I can go. And let you bless me. I know that things that are not of you are truly useless. I will be working in vain. Thank you, Lord, for your heavenly perspective. And the teardrops that I sow, I shall reap with joy and sing. Thank you, God, for your son, Jesus Christ. That heavenly pursuit, I seek him. I seek your word. I seek your blessing, your comfort, and your peace, your strength. I thank you, God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You are my source in all things in life. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I thank you, Jesus. Amen. I hope you guys enjoyed this devotional. May y'all be blessed. May you sleep well. May you be renewed in the spirit. May everything be connected. Continue to pray. And ask God for all that you need. Not what you want, but all that you need. Because everything is provided. He said we can come to him and we can talk to him. Ask and you shall receive according to his word. It has to line up with his word. So y'all be blessed. Happy hump day, everybody. This is 48 minutes long, and I send y'all 48 hugs and many blessings. I will be back to talk to you guys later if it is God's will. Bye, sister.